All right, we're on the Sheol, examination of the word Sheol, and uh, let's take a look at that, letter S, Sheol. We've already done part of it, <coughs> S-H-E-O-L. We did an article there written by Dr. Robert A. Morey. Great reference book to use. And we look at Philippians 1.23, which is a New Testament reflection on what David was saying in Psalm 16.8-11. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. And then he says, because you will not abandon me to Sheol, nor will you let your body, your Holy One, see decay. Let's take a look at that. In Psalm 16.10, because you will not abandon my soul <clears throat> to Sheol. So the soul is present in Sheol. The afterlife, you will not allow your godly ones to see a pit. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your holy one to, to undergo decay. Look under different translations. Soul is in Sheol. So the body and the soul are separated. The soul is in Sheol. And so there was going to be a, a uh, joining of God uh, with David. So you have to be careful here. The Holman standard doesn't say the word soul. So you could interpret it in a number of ways. Most of the translations say soul. <clears> that <throat> will not leave my soul in hell. Actually, that's a mistranslation. Sheol. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The realm of the dead. See, now the NIV, I go with the NASB. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Okay. <clears throat> now we look in the New Testament reflection on this. The Apostle Paul states in Philippians 1.23, I am torn between the two to live as Christ, to die as gain. I desire to depart, die, and be with Christ, who at that moment and this is in heaven, which indicates that Paul would be conscious with the Lord in heaven, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, further indicating that the only other alternative offered not to be in the body is to be to be physically dead, results in a conscious existence and presence with Jesus Christ in heaven, where Christ now resides. So fifth, Sheol is under the earth, or the underworld, where graves were built as sepulchres above the earth, or caves or holes in the earth. Sheol is called the underworld in Isaiah 14.9. Sheol below is all astir. It is all also called the lower parts of the earth. Compare Isaiah 44.23. And Ezekiel 26, 20, Then I will bring you down with those who go down to the pit, to the people of long ago. I will make you dwell in the earth below, as in ancient ruins, with those who go down to the pit, and you will not return or take your place in the land of the living. Sheol, presence of the soul. We have other passages. Psalm 63, 9, But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. So Sheol is the opposite of heaven. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. Psalm 139, 8. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. One must therefore go down to get to Sheol. We have Genesis 37, 34 to 35. Then Jacob tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him. 
But he said, In mourning I will, will I go down to Sheol to my son. So his father wept for him. Notice that Jacob could not be saying that when he dies, he would have his head, dead son, would have his dead son dug up, dug up to have Jacob's body placed in the same grave with his son. Certainly Jacob means that he will see his son in the afterlife. Sixth, while bodies are unconscious in the grave, those in Sheol are viewed as being conscious. Seventh, an examination of the usages of Kevar and Sheol reveals that Sheol cannot mean the grave. The following 20, look at these, all 20, 20 contrasts between Kevar and Sheol demonstrate this point. So you can take a look. First couple ones we can read. While Kevar to, to bury is used in connection with Kevar, it is never used in connection with Sheol. We can bury someone in a grave, but we cannot bury anyone in Sheol. And Kavar is, is found in its plural form, graves. The word Sheol is never pluralized. And while a grave is located at a specific site, Sheol is never localized because it is everywhere accessible at death, no matter where the death takes place. No grave is necessary in order to go to Sheol. It's not the grave. We can purchase or sell a grave, but you don't sell Sheol. We can own a grave, but not Sheol. We discriminate between graves and pick the choice of site, Nowhere in Sheol in Scripture is a choice Sheol pitted against a poor Sheol. And so on. So much logical. 21 points. The last one. While we can visit the graves of loved ones, nowhere in Scripture is man said to visit Sheol. So. <clears throat> now we're looking at Sheol and its inhabitants. The following things are stated about Sheol and its inhabitants. First, Sheol is said to have gates by which one enters and bars which keep one in. Such figurative language conveys the idea that Sheol is a realm from which no escape is possible. Second, Old Testament describes Sheol in the following ways. Sheol is a shadowy place or a place of darkness. Evidently, it is in another dimension which is not exposed to the rays of the sun. Two, it is viewed as being down beneath the earth or in the lower parts of the earth. These figures of speech indicate that Sheol is not part of this world, but has an existence of its own in another dimension. It's a place where one can reunite with his ancestors, tribe, or people. This cannot refer to a common mass grave where everyone is buried. No such graves ever existed in recorded history. Sheol is the place where the souls of all men go at death. This is why De Jacob looked forward to reuniting with his son Joseph in Sheol. <clears throat> While death meant separation from the living, the Old Testament prophets clearly understood it also meant reunion with the departed. departed. Seems that Sheol has different sections. There's contrast between the lowest part and the highest part of Sheol. This figurative language implies that there are divisions or distinctions within Sheol. Perhaps the Old Testament's emphatic distinction between the righteous and the wicked in this life indicates that this distinction continues on in the afterlife. Thus the wicked are said to be in the lowest part, while the righteous are in the highest part. This is not clearly stated in the Old Testament. There seems to be some kind of distinction, though. Third, the condition of those in Sheol is described in the following ways. At death, man becomes a refiam, or a ghost, or a shade, or a disembodied spirit. So instead of describing man as passing into non-existence, the Old Testament states that man becomes a disembodied spirit. So the usage of the word refiam irref irrefutably establishes this truth. So from the meaning of Rephiam, it is clear that when the body dies, man enters a new kind of existence and experience. Now exists as a spirit creature and experiences what angels and other disincarnate spirits experience. Just as angels are disincarnate energy beings composed only of mind or mental energy and are capable of super-dimensional activity and such things as thought and speech without the need of a physical body, even so man dies, he too becomes a disembodied supra-dimensional energy being and is capable of thought and speech without the need of a body. This is why the dead are described as spirits and ghosts 
throughout the scriptures. This concept is carried on to the New Testament in such places as Luke 24, 37-39. A belief in ghosts necessarily entails a belief that man survives the death of the body. Sheol, those in Sheol are pictured as conveying with each other and even making moral judgments on the lifestyle of new arrivals. They are thus conscious entities while in Sheol. <clears throat> Once in Sheol, all experiences related exclusively to physical life are no longer possible. Those in Sheol do not marry or, and procreate children because they do not have bodies. Neither do they plan and execute business transactions. Once in Sheol, they cannot attend public worship in the temple and give sacrifices of praise. There are no bodily pleasures such as eating and drinking. Those in Sheol do not have any wisdom or knowledge about what is happening in the land of the living. They are cut off from the living. They have entered a new dimension of reality with its own kind of existence. So God's judgment upon the wicked does not cease when the wicked die in their sins. Thus some of the spirits in Sheol experience the following. God's anger, his distress, writhing in distress of the uh, those in Sheol, writhing in pain. So it is obvious that non-existence or soul sleep can hardly experience anger, distress, or pain. Thus there are hints in the above passages that not everyone experiences blessedness in the afterlife. Because these three passages, the Old Testament does not speak of torment in the intermediate state, while it speaks of the everlasting humiliation and contempt which awaits the wicked after the resurrection. The Old Testament tells us very little about the intermediate suffering of the wicked in Sheol. In the Old Testament, the righteous as well as the wicked went to Sheol at death. <clears throat> now, while the overall picture of death was somewhat gloomy in the Old Testament, yet God had begun to reveal to his people that they would be ushered into his joyous presence after death. To be sure, there were only hints of glory, but hints they were, hints they were nevertheless. The ascension of Enoch and Elijah to heaven indicated that the righteous would be taken into God's presence. And the verb which describes Enoch's and Elijah's ascension while later used to describe the passage, oops, later used to describe the passage of the righteous out of Sheol to heaven, Asaph expressed the hope that he would go to dwell at the throne of glory at death. <clears throat> the Old Testament saints looked forward to reuniting with the departed ones. And also, the Old Testament believers knew that Sheol was open to God's sight and that they would still be in presence and promote and protect it. Psalm 139.8 So finally, upon simply believing God's plan for him, and for that matter all mankind relative to salvation through the seed of Abraham, Abraham was given God's unconditional guarantee of eternal life, a life after death, one of being in the kingdom of earth on e forever. And those of the faith of Abraham look forward to the same covenant promise. So you look to Paul's work, Romans 4, 1 to 12. So the next step is to look at what Hades has to offer. That's the Greek afterlife term.